right, welcome everyone. Welcome to the front row. My name is Jamie Williamson. I'm the Executive Vice President here at Scripps Research. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to our fourth front row lecture in the coronavirus series, a very topical uh, subject. Everyone's uh, got it on their mind and we are trying to bring you insights into treatments and uh, the fundamental science of, of the virus. I, I do uh, want to just quickly say a couple things about Scripps for those of you who are new to us. Uh, we have 200 faculty scattered across two campuses in uh, these five departments that you see here. Uh, and we also have a, an accredited PhD program. We're very proud of that. And it's nationally ranked by US News and World Report as number one, uh, sorry, in the top 10 in uh, chemistry and biology. And one of the things that's positioned Scripps research in it to be well poised to make an impact on coronavirus is that we have decades of experience in researching other viruses like HIV and flu. And Scripps has been very adept at pivoting to work on this current epidemic. And you'll hear more about that today. We've got a lot of drugs under our belt in terms of pr providing medicines that impact human health. And most recently, we had Ozanamod approved uh, for uh, relapsing multiple sclerosis. In terms of uh, studying the virus and, and other kinds of infectious disease, we're trying to put this together under the rubric of a global health initiative. That's a, a collaboration between the three arms of Scripps. One is the Scripps research, the basic research arm. Caliber is the drug discovery arm led by our president, Pete Schultz, and the Scripps Research Translational Institute led by Dr. Eric Topol, which is, has an emphasis on digital and personal medicine. The three pillars of this global health initiative are to detect, prevent, and treat any infectious disease. So detection involves both surveillance and developing diagnostics. Uh, prevention is most likely to be in the form of some kind of vaccine, and then treatment is in the form of antiviral therapeutics. We've had a few lectures. Uh, our first lecture in this series was Christian Anderson, who's our epidemiologist, and he tracks the viral outbreaks by sequencing. And then uh, we had a, a lecture from our Florida campus uh, by Mark Farzan, who uh, talked about making uh, vaccines. And then uh, last front row was by Arnab Chatterjee, who works at the Caliber Institute. And uh, he was talking about using uh, uh, known drugs to repurpose them for antivirals that combat coronavirus. So uh, today, I'm really pleased to introduce Dennis Burton. Dennis is the chairman of the Department of Immunology and Microbiology. Uh, and he's, he's done a tremendous amount of work on infectious disease. And uh, I, I think Dennis is going to give us a little bit of a primer on antibodies and viruses and really try to help you understand uh, how the virus works and what we can do uh, with antibodies to help combat that virus. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to Dennis at this point. And uh, one of the things we're going to do at the end is uh, we'll do Q&A. So you can type in Q&A. I prefer you use Q&A rather than the chat. And, uh, and then we'll get all the questions uh, kind of uh, teed up. And uh, Dennis and I will, I, I will moderate and, and try to read your questions off to Dennis uh, at the end. So you can type in at any time that you have a question. And, uh, and then we'll get... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll try to get you a, a, an answer. We, we probably won't have time for all the questions, but some, lots of times there are themes that emerge in the question and I'll try to get those together. So uh, at this point, Dennis, why don't you take over screen share and uh, I look forward to your lecture. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining, taking time out. Um, so what I want to do is to give, a, as, as Jamie said, a, a very general talk 
um, that's accessible to all. Um, if you're not really sure what a virus is or not really sure what antibodies are, don't worry. I'm going to try and um, explain and, and, and link all these things together in a way that will um, hopefully increase understanding generally for um, uh, these types of uh, infectious disease. So let me go straight into it. Um, so these are the topics that I want to cover. So first of all, uh, SARS-CoV-2, that's the virus that causes COVID-19. Antibodies, basics. Uh, then bringing together antibodies and SARS-CoV-2 and, and better understanding of how we respond to the first time we see a virus, as is the case for all of us with this virus. Our own work in the last few weeks on, this, uh, on antibodies to this virus and then uh, vaccines and some basic um, coverage of uh, vaccines. Okay, so let's start out with um, SARS-CoV-2. So, and you've seen this picture, I'm sure, a lot in the media. SARS-CoV-2 is a um, coronavirus, comes from that, those um, red proteins giving the crown-like appearance. They're called the spike protein or the um, S protein. And folks ask uh, often, you know, are viruses live or are they dead? And um, the answer to that is, um, in a way, they're neither. They're sort of undead. Um, we often associate life with the ability to reproduce, to replicate, and um, we, we can do that. Uh, bacteria can do that. Viruses can only do that if they can get into um, host cells, take over the host cell machinery, and reproduce themselves. So they're somewhere stuck in, in, the, um, in the middle uh, in terms of, of what they are uh, life-wise. Let's now take a look at, um, and I'll come back and uh, consider matters in a little more detail, but let's just take a look at a short video of um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, entering a cell. The large S glycoproteins are used by the virus to gain entry to human cells. They attach to receptors on the cell membrane. This binding convinces the cell that the viron is not a threat, allowing the virus entry. The exact mechanism for this is not known. Possibly the virus binds with the human cell's membrane, releasing its contents into the cytoplasm. Alternatively, as shown here, the human cell ingests the virus in a process known as endocytosis. Once inside the cytoplasm, the endosome opens to reveal the virus's genetic material, a single-stranded RNA. The virus hijacks the cell's machinery to replicate the RNA and N proteins and uses the endoplasmic reticulum to form its M protein outer layer and the all-important S protein. After replication, the virus is carried by the Golgi bodies out of the cell in a process known as exocytosis so that it can infect other cells. Meanwhile, the stress of viral production on the endoplasmic reticulum eventually leads to apoptosis, or cell death. It should be noted that the mechanism of action for 2019 novel coronavirus is unknown. However, scientists in China have sequenced the genome, while others have used the sequencing to visualize the structure. The large... Okay, so let's look more closely now at the, uh, the virus itself. Here it is. It's a, 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 a nucleic acid. It's actually RNA. That encodes the, um, the virus proteins. That's what allows it to take over the host cell machinery inside of a membrane. And then on the outside of the, uh, the virus, we have these um, spike proteins. And for the purposes of vaccines, um, designed to induce antibodies and um, antibodies themselves in their antiviral activity. It's really just the surface that we're interested. And it's really just this S protein, which uh, is represented here. The structure has been solved. It has this uh, binding domain, which uh, binds to the um, ACE2 receptor, as it's called, on the surface of host cells and allows the virus to get into those um, cells. So 
bringing together antibodies and uh, the virus. Here you can see to scale uh, antibody molecules in purple, the Y-shaped molecules, and here's the, the virus. And what neutralizing antibodies do is they basically coat the surface of the virus. So you have a purple coating on the, um, on, on the surface here, and that prevents the virus from getting into, uh, into host cells. And if it can't do that, it can't replicate, and it is a, um, a, a dead virus. So, and here's uh, seeing, looking at the relative sizes. Here you see the antibody molecules in purple and the S protein. Okay, so that's, that's the virus. And we started on antibodies. Let's take a closer look at uh, what antibodies are. You for sure have seen many times this Y shape. Um, what does this represent? Well, the antibody protein molecule has two arms which are identical. And these are the arms which at their extremities uh, bind to or recognize foreign materials such as viruses, bacteria, and so on. And then this stem part is a part which is able to lead to the elimination of whatever has been detected up here. So that's the basic uh, antibody um, structure. And antibodies are the keys really to resisting uh, reinfection, why you tend not to get infected with the same uh, virus or bacterium again, and really to the success of vaccines. And probably one of the most fundamental things that you can say about antibodies is that they recognize shapes. They recognize molecular shapes, the shapes of proteins. And they have to be able to do that in a particular way. They have to be able to recognize the shapes that are, that are foreign to your body and distinguish them from the shapes that are you. You cannot have antibodies going after your own proteins and destroying your own cells and so on. That's autoimmunity. Um, that you know must not happen on any on any scale. So the antibodies have to recognise the shapes that are found in um, in pathogens, in uh, invaders like bacteria and viruses. And here's an example of an antibody recognising a shape. So it puts some um, substance to what I'm saying. And so here, what we have in grey. Uh, with red on here, you'll see a, um, a protein, HER2, that's found on the surface of breast cancer cells. And here is the arm, one of the arms of uh, an antibody. And here's the footprint in um, yellow. And this now surface here perfectly matches this, as you see here. This is the FAB arm of the antibody. And so it's recognized and bound to uh, that shape and that will lead eventually to the elimination of the uh, breast cancer cell. And many different shapes can be recognized. I just showed you this one, but the shape could be, it could be stuck out like that, or it could be stuck in like this, or flat, or whatever. But, but many, many different shapes can be recognized. In fact, any shape can be um, recognized. And this is one of the most important things about antibodies. Now I'm going to show you another short video of, of antibodies. And this gets somewhat technical in the last 30 seconds or so, but please don't worry about that. I'll come back to this issue of, of the fact that you can make so many antibodies, because that for a long time was a mystery, how you could make literally billions of antibodies. So let's just look at this. People are full of antibodies a lot of antibodies. These proteins are a vital part of the immune system. But just how the body makes such a variety of them mystified scientists for decades. The human immune system has to fight off an endless variety of bacteria, viruses and parasites. And for each invader, it needs a specific antibody. Luckily, it can generate billions of them, each slightly different, ready for any disease. But 
these antibodies made from two light chains and two heavy chains are proteins. And billions of different proteins should need billions of genes to make them. Humans have around 20,000 genes. The solution to this problem was a Nobel Prize winning discovery. Antibodies are made by B cells. Like every other cell, B cells start off with the same 20,000 genes but they also have an enzyme called RAG. RAG is a DNA shuffler. It targets the genes that make the antibodies binding site. There are three kinds of gene segments here, called V, D, and J. For the heavy chain of the antibody, humans usually have around 130 different V segments, 27 D segments, and six J segments. The RAG enzyme binds to one of the J segments at random, and then, to one of the D segments, chopping off the spare DNA between them. The enzymes then join the ends together. The same thing happens with a random V segment. So you end up with a G composed of one V, one D and one J joined together. This provides over 20,000 possible VDJ combinations for the heavy chain. The light chain can have another 400 possible gene combinations. Combining heavy and light chains gives approximately 8 million different possible antibodies, each with a different binding site. That's not all. During the joining, extra DNA is added or removed at the junctions of the segments, which takes our antibody diversity from the millions into the billions. This is how our immune system can respond to diseases it's never even seen before. In fact, there's so much diversity that one of our antibodies could potentially bind to almost any target in the whole universe. People are... Which is um, just as well, because as we know, there are a lot of different um, pathogens, bacteria, viruses out there that would like to get us. And uh, we need to be able to uh, take care of them all. In fact, a recent study that we did in 2019 suggests that the repertoire is even larger, the number of antibodies we can make. It's probably uh, humans can make of the order of a billion billion uh, different antibodies, which is actually uh, referred to as a quintillion. So we can make all these different antibodies. They actually can improve the more they see a given shape, and that's why you tend to get better antibodies later um, as uh, 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 later in an infection. And then there's antibody memory, and this is so important for vaccines. So once you've made antibodies, then um, the cells that have made them will then migrate to the uh, bone marrow and just keep chunking out antibodies for many, many years. So um, for example, against yellow fever, you people have been found who can still make antibodies 65 years later, and they would still be protected uh, after, after such a long time that they had their original contact with the yellow fever virus. So these are important features of, um, of um, antibodies, the most important. So now let's bring the two uh, together again. And uh, let's talk about immune responses on a first infection with the virus, which is really, uh, as I said earlier, exactly what happens with uh, SARS-CoV-2. This is the first time that we've, any of us have encountered uh, this virus. So if we look at uh, what happens, we, we encounter the virus, we become infected. The virus replicates very, very exponentially uh, in our bodies, and the viral load that we're carrying increases and increases uh, very rapidly. If it goes on increase, increasing, then eventually um, the virus will kill us. But what most normally happens is that immune responses kick in, bring the viral load back down, and we return uh, to normal hopefully now with a level of immunity. So that's what happens with the viral load. And as soon as the virus is detected, then uh, things begin to happen in our bodies. 
The first thing is an, an innate response. So the cells that we have um, have all sorts of mechanisms within them to detect foreign genetic material coming from the outside. And those uh, responses can kick in and, uh, and take care of those responses, most probably by, for example, killing the cell that was infected. And this in itself can help resolve infection. However, it sometimes happens that this kind of response and others keep going too strongly and don't sense, if you like, that the, 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 the virus has been cleared. And then you run into trouble because you now start uh, getting all sorts of uh, strong mechanisms involved that can damage your own tissue. And indeed, that's what seems to happen in, in, in COVID-19, that you make an immune response and then uh, there's a second period when you start uh, damaging your own tissues and that uh, often is uh, one of the worst things that can happen. So there's the innate response. Um, for many viral infections, the, the infection, the first in time you have an infection is not resolved by antibodies, it's resolved by T cells. And these are cells, white blood cells, that are designed to screen, to circulate and screen for uh, infected cells and take them out. And that T cell response is generally what will be very important in resolving a primary infection, the first time that we're infected. What will also happen in this early um, phase of infection is you'll start to make antibodies. And you will make antibodies against all the proteins of the virus, whether they're going to do you any good or not. The antibody system simply goes after foreign material. And um, these antibodies will come up quite quickly. They won't do you much good, but they are much used in diagnosis because they tend to come up uh, quickly. And then you'll have a second class of uh, antibodies that usually come up more slowly. And we refer to these as neutralizing antibodies. So these would be antibodies for example, against the uh, spike protein of um, SARS-CoV-2. And these antibodies um, will uh, help to clear the virus. And if you can keep making them over a longer time periods, will provide you with immunity. Because the next time you encounter the virus, you'll have these antibodies on board and they will go after the virus straight away. And so those are, 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 are the most powerful of the, uh, the antibodies. Actually, this is a, a generic for a, um, a viral infection, rather diagrammatic. The, the red curve here in SARS-CoV-2 appears to be moved quite a, uh, over in this direction. So it does seem to kick in quite quickly, which is, which is probably a good thing. So our team effort to isolate uh, neutralizing antibodies to SARS with the belief that these antibodies can be used both in uh, therapy and uh, prevention of uh, SARS-CoV-2. We started about um, eight weeks ago when we got our first uh, samples from convalescent donors. And I'll just, I'm not going to show you um, lots of data. I'm simply going to go through the major steps that we took. So these, when you get a new virus like this, you have to set up a lot of different things um, that are not there because you know the virus wasn't. So the first thing we had to do was to establish neutralization assays. So assays by which we could tell whether or not um, we were looking at antibodies that were indeed uh, stopping the virus getting into cells. So we established these neutralization assays. We then, um, through UCSD, uh, uh, established cohorts of um, donors very, very generously gave us uh, blood samples that we could look and see whether their, their sera were able to inhibit in these assays viral entry. And uh, we found that uh, many of the donors could. And we, went, we then uh, focused on those donors who had the best, highest titers. We had to generate the, the proteins and fragments 
that we would need for antibody isolation. So we would know that these were the right antibodies. And then using the best donors, the ones with the highest neutralizing titers in their sera, we isolated a thousand, more than a thousand monoclonal antibodies. So these are antibodies that are from one cell, one type of antibody. You're familiar with these sorts of antibodies. They're used much in, uh, in cancer therapy and in, in controlling uh, autoimmune diseases, for example. Uh, Herceptin would be uh, an, an example. And we identified panels of these neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. So we know, we know that in test tubes, they work very well in stopping viral entry. We then asked, well, do they work in vivo? In, in, uh, we'd like to know if they work in people, of course, but uh, the first step is to see if they work in animal models. And an animal model of SARS-CoV-2 is provided by Syrian hamsters. And so I'll just show you, um, uh, uh, well, first I'll just show you um, that we've uh, published this work. It's actually online. We're now trying to get it into a, a major uh, journal. Tom Rogers led much of the, um, the uh, animal work and um, uh, m many of our collaborators, Devon Soap, Joe Jardine, uh, and myself were the other senior authors on this uh, uh, study. And um, here's the result of the um, hamster experiment. The, um, the hamsters don't die from SARS-CoV-2. They don't even get sick. They're, after a, a few days, they clear the virus and they're fine. But what does happen, which is good for us, is that uh, they do lose weight. So this is a control. So these are hamsters that are infected with SARS-CoV-2 and we wait and then we see that the, um, they lose weight in a few days, uh, five days here, they've lost a lot of weight really, you know, down to around 15% of their body mass. They recover that very quickly. But if we um, give them a small amount of antibody before the virus, not much different, they, they still lose weight. But if we give them higher doses of antibody, now we see they don't lose weight. Now, actually, these, these even seem to gain a bit of weight, but uh, that, that may or may not be significant. But what is clear is that the, they haven't lost weight, the hamsters are protected, and we can see that by other means against viral infection. So this bodes well for these antibodies. They, um, uh, they, they do seem to work in, um, in an animal model. So what we really need to know now is, do these antibodies work in humans uh, in a protective, prophylactic mode, and also hopefully in a therapeutic mode? Um, as you know, uh, folks are now using or, or um, a number of, of, of um, uh, centers are now looking at plasma, uh, blood purified from um, convalescent donors, and they're relying on the levels of antibodies in those plasma to have some antiviral activity. These are not ideal convalescent plasma because it varies a lot between, the amounts of antibodies vary a lot, and um, uh, most of the antibodies in the convalescent plasma are in fact not uh, neutralizing. They're not gonna do anything. But um, as a first step, that's a very reasonable one. Monoclonals are much more precise and uh, can be made in very large amounts as a standard reagent. So that's what we're trying to do now. And for the future, what we'd like to have is antibodies not just against SARS-CoV-2, but we'd like to find antibodies that also would stop SARS-CoV-1, and hopefully even new emerging coronaviruses. So one could imagine that you um, make antibodies that are pan coronavirus and you have them ready so the next time there's this kind of a pandemic we have something immediately available and can shut it down um, as early as possible. Okay so that's antibodies and I'm now um, going to finish off on um, vaccines. So let's just uh, talk a little bit first about, about vaccines in a very general way. Um, and, and a lot of this is probably fairly clear, but maybe not all of it. 
So most vaccines are based around the idea of immunizing with shapes from the virus in a non-harmful form so that you induce neutralizing antibodies without having to go through um, symptoms of disease. And this um, uh, vaccines were first described actually very, very long time ago, even by uh, even in uh, uh, early uh, China. But the first person who really uh, brought vaccines into um, uh, clear perspective and application was an English uh, country doctor called Edward Jenner. And um, what he noted was that um, many English uh, folk songs refer to the, uh, the, the beauty of um, milkmaids. And that originates in the fact that their skin, their facial skin, was not marked, pockmarked by smallpox. So many people who survived smallpox uh, had their faces pockmarked uh, with the signs of the, uh, of the pox. But the, the, the milkmaids nevertheless had their, their hands um, marked by cowpox. And so he reasoned that cowpox might uh, protect against smallpox. And so what he did is a human experiment that would certainly never be allowed today. But what he did was to take a small child and he uh, infected him with cowpox and then waited and then later uh, challenged or exposed the child to smallpox, uh, virulent smallpox, and the child did not become uh, infected. And that was really the first vaccination. And it worked because um, of um, mimicry, that the, the cowpox was sufficiently similar to the smallpox such that the immune response was generated that would cross-react with smallpox. And that's the basis of many different uh, vaccines that have been highly successful today, live attenuated vaccines, um, killed vaccines, and um, uh, subunit vaccines. Subunit vaccines are simply where you take the uh, protein from the surface of the, uh, the virus or, or bacterium and uh, immunize with that and try and induce antibodies that will then uh, react and against the whole pathogen. And those uh, have been uh, quite successful also. So um, in the case of uh, COVID-19 vaccines, most of those uh, approaches are being uh, adopted. And so if we go from the bottom, you can see the conventional uh, approaches, live attenuated, inactivated vaccines, Vectored vaccines are more recent, so what these are is a, a, um, uh, uh, um, a, uh, a virus that will infect human cells without doing damage, uh, but in which the uh, S protein has been incorporated. So the virus will infect, will express the S protein, and the human will make antibodies against the S protein, and they will hopefully protect. An example would be the Oxford uh, chimpanzee adenovirus um, vector vaccine. The recombinant protein vaccines, that's taking the S protein. And then you have these more recent vaccines, which are referred to as genetic uh, vaccines for genetic immunization. And the notion here is that you take the gene for the uh, S protein and incorporate it into DNA or uh, RNA, these are put directly into a, into a person. They go, for example, into muscle cells, the cells start making the S protein, and the human then makes antibodies against the S protein. These two can move very quickly because all you need is the gene sequence. Here, you've got to do much more work. So that's why these have gone into the clinic uh, most quickly, and I'm sure you've heard of Moderna's uh, first trials using uh, mRNA. Now, um, how, how quickly can this go? Um, and the answer is, usually these things take years. But, you know, given the emergency, of course, every uh, attempt is being made to uh, deliver a vaccine as quickly as possible. So these are the normal stages a good manufacturing process, so you have to make the vaccine under 
sterilizing conditions and show that you've done that. You usually do the trial in a small number of people, then a larger number of people looking really for safety, and then a much larger number of people looking for efficacy. And if all that works out, then a vaccine becomes licensed. Um, it's got to be approved by, for example, the FDA, and then you need to make large amounts. And this whole process can typically take many, many years. And I'm sure you've heard in the media, the talk here has been um, you know, reducing this to 12 months, 18 months. And that's, that seems possible, but uh, at this time we can't really uh, say how quickly this is all going to, uh, to happen. It depends very much on how uh, well the, uh, uh, how the antibody responses are to the vaccines that have gone in. And then one question that we can ask is, what if we encounter problems in vaccine development? And um, there are various problems that could be encountered. Personally, I, I think that the vaccines that are available, some of them will work and will uh, be quite successful, but it's good to have a plan B, it's good to have a plan C. Um, so we may encounter problems, the problems that may be encountered are, for example, with certain vaccines, it's possible in a certain number of individuals that you get enhancement of infection under certain uh, conditions. I think that's unlikely here, but it's not completely impossible. Um, and then there's also a problem of how long the immunity is provided for, what levels of antibodies uh, provide immunity and how long. So, you know, if you have to give a vaccine every few weeks, that's not really what you want to do. You really want a vaccine that lasts as long as possible. And there are ways in which you could make a vaccine better and avoid problems. And that's really um, uh, shown here. Um, and that's a, an approach that we've been adopting in HIV, which we refer to as um, reverse vaccinology. And the idea here is, uh, we call it reverse vaccinology because we work backwards from uh, protective antibodies to a vaccine. So for the case of SARS-CoV-2, what we'd say is, we have some great antibodies here. We know we'd like to induce them through vaccination. How can we do it? Well, if we can define the shapes that they recognize, and that may be only a part of the S protein, then we can maybe uh, uh, build those shapes, take several of them in, and incorporate them into a vaccine. And if we give those to uh, uninfected individuals, then um, hopefully they'll make these uh, uh, protective antibodies. Given the fact that this is all a, a shape question, if you've got the right molecular shapes, then you should be able to induce the right antibodies. So this would be a more precise, precision-oriented approach that might have meaning if our straightforward approaches encounter some problems. And um, we discussed this recently um, in, a, in a short review that we wrote that was published last week, I think, where we talked about rational vaccine design in the time of COVID-19 um, and how this might help us to design more precise vaccines if we do have uh, problems that we will um, encounter, that, we, that will emerge uh, or not in the next few months. So overall, I would say from vaccine standpoint, I'd be uh, quite optimistic. This is not HIV, this is not one of the most uh, difficult pathogens. But having said that, you know, nature can always be full of surprises. So um, we should uh, prepare as far as possible um, with uh, uh, alternate solutions. So I just, I'm gonna stop there and take questions. I just wanna acknowledge the fact that we are basically uh, an HIV lab that has, uh, is very heavily funded by the, the, the NIH and by the uh, Gates Foundation and IRV and the Reagan Institute. We turned all our efforts uh, of the last two months over to um, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2. And we hope that the antibodies that we've generated will prove uh, useful from a um, 
direct application standpoint uh, as drugs, as prophylactics, and to help us guide um, vaccine design. So I will uh, stop there and hand over to uh, back to uh, Jamie. Okay, thanks a lot, Dennis. That was that was great. I I hope everybody got a. Uh, a lot of information about virus and antibodies and how this is working. Uh, I've been monitoring some of the questions and uh, there, there's some, there's some themes. Uh, so, so one of the, one of the theme questions really is how uh, or why are certain um, vaccines something that you have to do every year, whereas, whereas some protect you from life. So for example, measles is essentially your whole life. But, but people get a flu shot every year. So what's going on under the hood that leads to these variable dosings? Great, great question. So um, th th there are actually two different um, scenarios there. So let's take measles first. If you get infected with measles, then um, you, know, you get a full blown infection, you'll probably be quite sick. You will make a very strong responses, very strong. And you will lay down probably some very good uh, antibody producing cells at quite a high level, and they will last you probably for the rest of your life if you're infected with measles. If you're immunized with measles, the amount of measles that you will see is probably quite a lot less. You know, you don't want to have to go through measles, all the symptoms before, uh, you know, in order to get vaccinated. And that will lead to a somewhat lesser um, uh, measles response. So the, the, the antibodies that you lay down and the response will probably be quite a lot less. And you know this problem has actually appeared in terms of uh, mother to child uh, protection. You know that children are protected um, early, very early in life from uh, maternal with the mother's antibodies. Now, when mothers were infected with measles, they, they, they often had very good titers that lasted a very long time, and those titers would transfer to the mother and the, the kids would be fine. When the mothers now are all vaccinated and don't have measles, they might need to get another shot uh, in order for them, measles antibodies to be high enough to really protect their kids. So the, the answer is the form in which the pathogen was encountered for measles. For influenza, it's a different story. So for influenza, the virus changes every year. The virus is going through pigs and birds and pigs. It's changing all the time. And so the uh, vaccine that gave you all that good protection in um, 2019 likely will not do so well in 2020. And so um, what, you would, what we'd really like to have is a universal flu vaccine, is a vaccine that would protect against all strains. And indeed, using reverse vaccinology, that's been one of the major uh, efforts in the flu field. And hopefully that will eventually make it to fruition, but it's difficult because these pathogens are really slippery. They know how to, they know how to coexist. That's a, that's a good follow-up question. So I think there's a lot of interest in what do we know about how rapidly coronavirus mutates and yeah. do, are we concerned about its mutation making um, it difficult to develop a vaccine? I mean, so far, I, I think the mutation rate's been slow. Um, it's been uh, particular. It, it's not given us great grounds to um, fear um, that it's going to be like flu, for example. Having said that, there is one mutation that appears to have occurred, uh, particularly in Europe, and actually, just today, we were looking at that mutation, and it does seem to, at least in test. Tubes, um, if you like, uh, infect a bit more easily. Um, that's controversial at the minute. So I think, like with many things with this virus, you will hear, um, you know, statements, and then they will be changed a few le weeks later as more information is gathered. So at the moment, I think 
probably people are not so worried about mutation, but you know, care. Let's 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 watch the thing very carefully and make sure it, it doesn't mutate into a uh, more infectious or a more resistant form. So you had a nice uh, graph that showed the time course of all of the ways our body responds to an infection. So, so if, if you have antibodies, is there any way to tell, you know, when you got infected? So can you, can you look at the antibodies in, in a person's blood and, and, and learn anything about where they are in the, in the exposure? Was it six months ago, two weeks ago, or even 25 years ago? Uh, good question. Um, I don't think so, not really, because there's so much variation in the levels and types of antibodies that people make. So, you know, they may have hardly any antibodies now, um, but that, that could be that they did indeed have an infection two weeks ago, but they just didn't make much of a response because they didn't need to because they, there wasn't much virus replication. Or, you know, it could have been they had it 50 years ago and it's decayed away. So, so there's a, a wide range of severity of, of symptoms. Some people are, you know, incredibly sick. Uh, some people are asymptomatic. And is, do you think there's any correlation in the, the nature of the antibody response and the number of neutralizing antibodies for those various kinds of progression paths? Uh, I think overall, I'd have to say we can't, we don't know. I think anecdotally, we thought at one time that the, we were getting better neutralizing antibody responses out of those who'd had a, a more severe course. I think as we've looked at more donors, that's in question. So I, I think that the, the true answer is here, like I just said a few moments ago, we don't actually know at this point in time. You might anticipate that the more virus you saw, the, the, the stronger would be your response. But there's a lot of other factors play in, play in there, genetics and so on. So I, I, I don't think we can answer that question now. Mm -hmm. So the, the spike protein, the S protein, is, is that a glycoprotein? And, and do, do we think the antibodies are going to be recognizing the, the glycosylation? It is a glycoprotein. It's not as heavily glycosylated as the HIV protein. Um, most likely not recognizing the, uh, the glycans. It's possible, but generally speaking, uh, the, the glycans are actually self because the, the, the sugars are, the, um, are put on by the host cell machinery. So they are your own sugars. So technically you shouldn't really recognize the sugars you may to a certain degree, but anyway, antibody binding to sugars tends to be rather weak and um, uh, protein amino acids in a protein are a much better target. And that's where most of the antibodies will be directed. Not exclusively, but probably, mostly. So uh, here's, here's an interesting uh, question. So if you vaccinate someone and they produce antibodies, does that person then essentially become a, a factory at, for convalescent sera that one could use in treatment? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the problem there is that, um, you know, it'll vary a lot between person to person. Most of the antibodies you're going to isolate from the convalescent sera are not uh, anti-COVID antibodies. They're mostly all sorts of other things. So, you know, it's very inefficient process. You put, you're giving people, um, you know, antibodies where only a few percent are actually doing anything. Um, and the, the antibodies titers will go down um, as, the, as the people go further away from the, uh, the infection. So generally speaking, so it, it's just a very non-standard and difficult way to do it totally worthwhile trying out initially but if you could make monoclonal antibodies you can then make them absolutely the same all the time in huge quantities you know kilograms thousands of kilograms in um you know standard conditions that are perfectly um reproducible and predictable so that's 
what, what, what you want to aim for. Right. So uh, one of the things that I, I, a lot of people are interested in is, is what happens after you're infected. And so are you immune to subsequent reinfection? And what do we know about that versus what do we hope about that? Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we know very little actually. I mean, what we do know comes from studies of small numbers of um, uh, mostly of, of monkeys um, where there's some evidence that having uh, neutralizing antibodies on board uh, provides some level of um, protection. But, um, you know, monkeys don't either get really the same disease that humans get. So it, it's, a little, it's a little bit fuzzy. And then you, so, you know, animal models always have a big limitation. So you'd like to know from humans. So then you can say, well, do humans get reinfected? And that's still controversial. I think some of the initial studies were probably are not correct because the, um, the folks that they thought were, were reinfected probably weren't infected in the first place. There was problems with the diagnostics. Um, and then um, later on, um, you, you can sometimes see that people have signs of virus much later after a, a, an early infection. But then it's not clear for sure whether they have been reinfected with 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 virus or they still have some um, remnants of RNA left around circulating uh, in their blood that's not infectious virus um, and that could mislead so you know it, 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 at, the, at this point in time we don't know um, number one if you are protected um, I'm pretty sure you will, will be if you have enough antibody, but we don't know what the level of that antibody is. And that's probably going to be the most crucial thing. How much antibody do you have to have to uh, protect you against uh, disease? And the amount that you, that you may have to have could be very different if you're talking about protection from severe disease or, you know, just getting some snuffles and, you know, you know, like a common cold. I mean, that would not be too bad if you just had cold-like symptoms. It, it's, it's when the virus gets into the lower respiratory tract and starts to damage the lungs. That's what you really got to stop. So there's, you, you went through all of the steps necessary for, uh, you know, making, making a vaccine or taking some of the antibodies that you have and putting them into people and having them widely available. Uh, where do you think is the biggest barrier in time and which are the most likely steps to fail? I mean, one of the biggest problems, I mean, if, if, if the vaccines are, are, are safe and effective, uh, which I tend to think they will be, then one of the biggest limitations will be making enough doses in a reasonable time. Um, and that would apply quite a bit to something like the Moderna mRNA, where you're going to have to make lots of things where that have not been probably made in those sorts of quantities before. So there's a strict technological problem about making enough material that's going to be, um, you know, one of the rate limiting steps. Um, but like I said, I mean, you may encounter problems on the way. Um, like um, that the immunity doesn't last very long or that you see an enhancement in some, in some people. If those things happen, the chances are that people will say, well, we, maybe we should just hold off for a little while here and, and, and get a better idea of what's going on. Um, it's it very difficult to answer without you know, actually seeing what happens in humans. So, so there was a, an outbreak of SARS a number of years ago, and that's a coronavirus. Yeah. And then there are other viruses, which I, for lack of a better term, I'll call benign coro coronaviruses. Seasonal, that, yeah. That give, that give, you know, colds yeah. that we're often exposed to. 
And uh, so, so how is it that this particular SARS COVID-19 is, you know, different than the, than the first SARS and then these benign coronaviruses? Yeah, I mean, I think that th this virus is um, more infectious than SARS-CoV-1. Uh, I'd call it that, CoV-1. Um, and it's probably more infectious because it binds more tightly to the ACE2 uh, receptor. So um, you probably need to have less virus and uh, the, the virus will stick and, and set up an infection. As to why the uh, so SARS-CoV-1 was 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 the more it was was more often fatal, uh, so the death rate and mortality was much higher. Um, I don't actually know the answer to why that would uh, be the case. It clearly causes more pathology and damage than does um, SARS-CoV-2. I'm not sure that's known or whether that's just that you know I haven't. Um, uh, read fully enough to understand that. I, I suspect that's not clear at this point in time. Okay, I, I think we're coming up on, on an hour and uh, I have about a hundred more questions and I, we just won't be able to get to them all. I tried to catch some common themes in, in the topic. So, so I first let me thank Dennis. Uh, that was great. A good primer on antibodies and vaccine, vaccines and, and viruses. Uh, I'd like also to thank everyone for tuning in. Again, uh, we have a lot of repeat uh, people that are attending the, this series, and it's great to have you all back. And uh, then uh, also thanks to KPBS, who's our co-sponsor for this front row lecture series. So uh, stay tuned. We have more exciting coronavirus research to bring to you. And uh, again, my, my name is Jamie Williamson, and I, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in to the front row.